Good morning. I uh, had to do, full disclosure, a little mirror check. I usually try not to eat between first and second service, but there was uh, muffins. <laughs> because if you call them muffins, they're healthy. If you call them cupcakes, it's junk food. And I learned, I learned this morning that if you eat a hamburger with a fork, it's a salad. <laughs> so if I have food in my teeth, just, I don't know why I'm telling you this other than just to tell you I've had a little moment of self-awareness on, anyway. <laughs> I, had a, I had a moment this week where I was asking God, I, I, uh, you ever, do you ever feel like that you're just frustrated with yourself about why can't I, why don't I, why are things not happening, why am I not smarter, why are, you know, just run of the mill stuff, nothing specific, I was praying about it. And I really felt like God just let me in on the idea of like, you, you, you can't. You can't, you've gone further than you can go. You're not gonna go any further. You're not gonna progress any further. You're not gonna accomplish anything else. You've gone as far as you can go unless I do it for you. And the reality of that, and, and here's how I understood that, is the reality of that is, I think so many times we feel challenged to do more or to be more or to accomplish more, to be a better husband or a better provider or a better this or a better that. And I think the challenge to me this week was that, that like, wait a minute, I've already gone further than I could go by myself. What would it look like then, then, to allow God to take me further? What's gonna be necessary? What's gonna be required? What will I have to do to allow God to have more control so that through him I go further? Does that, does that make sense? And we've been in a series, here's what's crazy. We've been in a, what, I was, what I thought was gonna be a four week series, which is a record, and then, and then I couldn't get through all the information that I had for this week and it turned into a two week series two-part finale to a four-week series. So if you guys keeping track, that's five. So take that, seminary. Um, Proverbs 4.23, you gotta be able to quote it by now because we've been at it and this is the fourth week. Um, it says, guard your heart. And when you look at the word heart in Proverbs, it's used in a lot of different ways. Uh, the first one being your reasoning, that when it talks about your heart, it means your reasoning. So many times when your, your reasoning relates to your heart, and so you gotta guard your reasoning. The second one is that it, it refers to your emotions, your heart as it refers to your emotions. So you are called to guard your emotions. And then the next one on the list, because I've said it now three weeks in a row, is guard your trust. Good, one person who's here in the first service. Guard your trust, and it, I, think, I think this is a fun one because I think if we can understand what's being said there, if we can understand what we're being tasked with, we're gonna have a whole lot better opportunity of getting it right. Because it doesn't say, observe your trust. Here's the thing, if you observe your trust, you're not expecting anything from it. If you're just standing on the sideline going, oh, I wonder what's gonna happen, there's no participation in that. There's no ownership of that. There's no accountability in that. And it doesn't say also, it doesn't say reserve your trust. This is a big one. Because how many times do you see people going, all right, God, you prove it. I've got my trust over here and I'm ready to give it to you, but uh, you better prove to me a few things that I need to see first and we reserve trust. And we do it, but that's not what's being said. It's actually part of what put Jesus on the cross is that he did all the miracles and they're like, yeah, we need a little bit more. We're gonna reserve our trust. It says, guard it. Proverbs chapter three, verse five and six, it says this, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. Let me help you uh, feel a little bit better. You will never fully accomplish that this side of heaven. If you're saying fully, fully trust in the Lord completely. Oh, and, you, and there's this moment of, I don't know if I can do that. That's what sanctification relates to, the process of learning how to fully rely on God. You're never gonna, I, I can't stand it when, a, when somebody who speaks goes, if you can get to where I'm at, which is to do it perfectly, no. It's the goal. It's, a, it's not a standard, it's a goal. It says, trust the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways submit to him and he'll make your paths straight. Here's why I know that that verse matters to everybody, is that on the end of our lives, when we look back over our lives, how many times even to this point in your life have you said these words, I wish I would have known then what I know now. Usually it's right after they draw the lottery numbers. If I'd only known. What you're saying, what person is saying is, if I would have only known then what I know now, I could have taken a shorter route. There was, a, there was a straight path available to me and I didn't take it. So this verse says, when you trust the Lord, he will make your paths straight. There's a promise tied to a commandment. This is a big verse and we're gonna try to do the best we can to understand it, but there's a lot to it. 
So we were this close, you guys. We were this close to having a five-week series and this Sunday being a three-point sermon. We were this close. I got to two. We have two points, which is still, I think, maybe a record. Um, if we're gonna if we're gonna learn how to guard our trust, if you are sitting in church this morning and you're going, okay, guard your trust sounds like a nice sermon. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how to take that home. I don't know how on a Tuesday when I'm sitting at work, I don't know what guard your trust even looks like. That is what we're gonna do in the next few minutes. I wanna understand two things. What it is, what is the trust that you're supposed to guard and why we have to guard it. What it is, why we have to guard it. If we can understand those two points, then we are gonna have a much better chance of going home and actually, actually improving and seeing things in our lives change for the better if we can understand those two things. First of all, what is it? How many of you guys, when you think of trust, you think of faith? Trust, faith, I mean, just it kind of all gets jumbled in. To understand how to guard your trust, you have to understand first that trust and faith are not the same thing. They're very different. And if you think of faith and trust as all being the same thing, then when somebody does something that's amazing and really allows God to bring them through some tough times, you go, I wish my faith was that strong. Because you're not, you're not understanding that it wasn't faith alone that did it. Let me explain what I'm talking about. It says that you've been given a measure of faith. Romans 12, 13 says it this way, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Everybody has been given enough faith. You, regardless of where you stand in your walk with God, you have been given enough faith to operate at a high level. But you go, well, not everybody operates at a high level. That's right, that's right. Let me explain why. Another translation says you've been given a measure of faith. If we go back to our school days, if it's a person, a place, or a thing, then we know that it is a noun. Thank you for getting it right, first service. <laughs> noun, person, place, or thing. It says that he has given you, he's distributed to you a measurable amount. That means this. That means that the faith that God has given you that you have. Now listen, if you go, I don't feel like I have much faith. The word says that you've been given faith. And if you're not operating in faith, we'll get to that in a minute. But you have to understand first, God says he gave you faith. If he didn't give you a measure of faith, you could never make the declaration to invite Jesus into your life. The declaration to invite Jesus into your life is it is is a demonstration of faith that Jesus is who he said he was, that was given to you. We love to take care of like, oh, I found my way to Jesus. Kinda, he sort of gave it to you. But that means that your faith is a noun. With me so far? But then you skip ahead and in Proverbs, we we'll to read it again, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding and all your ways submit to him and he'll make your paths straight. If I were to say, Go run to the road. Run is a verb. It's a verb because it's an action word. If you're sitting there shocked that I know all this, I have Google. <laughs> but so if it's a commandment, if God commands you to trust in him, then that means that faith being a noun, trust being a... Oh, you guys are a smart group. I gotta tell you, it's a weird space for me to be teaching about verbs and nouns. Somewhere in the world, uh, English teacher just lost its wings. Um, <laughs> it's been written this way. Faith always comes first, but trust is never guaranteed. So God gave you faith, but trust may or may not ever happen. Trust is not a guarantee in your life, faith is. It says it is a willful choice, a verb, a deliberate action and can only grow out of your faith. There's a story that tells us, it explains this better. In 1859, there was a guy named Blondin and Blondin was a tightrope walker. He was the first person to tightrope walk across from the American to the Canadian side of Niagara Falls. So he, he had a friend and I wrote these names down because I'm so good at names. His friend is Harry Colcord. Colcord was a friend, but he was also a manager. And they kind of, they, they publicized this well and they were good at marketing. And pretty soon they got where they had crowds of 10,000 people to come watch it because in 1859, there was no such thing as YouTube. They had to go see it for themselves. And there was this huge crowd and he'd walk and he would do all these crazy things. Pretty soon people get, begin to develop faith, follow me. They begin to develop faith that this guy was capable of doing what he said he was gonna do. They believed him. They believed that he could walk across the tightrope. And then one day in August, as part of the stunt, as part of this, this thing to get more crowd and get more attention, it says that he emerged on the American side carrying his friend Harry Colcord on his shoulders and walked across 
carrying him. Now, we're about to look at the difference between faith and trust. Listen to this quote. It says, the crowd had faith he'd accomplished these feats, but he trusted his abilities to complete them. Let me give you an example. He says this. He says, they get halfway across and Blondin told his manager, he said, look up, Harry, you are no longer call cord, you are Blondin. Stick with me. Until I clear this place, be a part of me, mind, body, and soul. If I sway, sway with me. Do not attempt to balance yourself. If I had to guess, you know, if there was a, a top 10 list of things that really slow the church down or disrupt the church or ruin the lives of the people who are making an effort or, or, or the disconnect between the people who profess to follow Jesus and the people who actually follow is that we've got an overabundance of faith and a complete undersupply of trust. Don't you, don't you think that would cause questions for people to hear you say what you believe and this is not, this, listen, this is not at a judgmental level. This is just, just think about it. It's just a common sense level. If someone claims to believe something with their words, but in their actions, they demonstrate with the action, with the noun, they claim this, but with the verb, it doesn't look like they actually believe what they say they believe. Wouldn't, wouldn't the word, and I know we love this word in church, but wouldn't the word hypocrite kind of begin to, Think about this. If you were to ask a guy, hey, do you think that that guy can walk across that tightrope? The 10,000 would have gone, oh yeah, for sure. I've seen him do it. He can do it for sure. Well, can he carry you? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm sure he could. I'm sure he could, but I mean, you just never know. You see the difference between the noun of faith and the verb of trust? I think it's our biggest hurdle. So now we know what it is. Second point, I'm gonna warn you, the second point is longer than the first one, so if you think we're halfway done, we're not. <laughs> I used to hate that when the pastor would save his longest point for the last point. He'd be like, and my final point is, and we're like, oh, we're gonna get out of here early. No, nope. <laughs> no, nope. this is the longer point. Matthew 13. So Jesus, on his first campaign to Galilee, performed a lot of miracles. He was there establishing who he was. He was developing faith in the people. He was doing miracles. He was healing people. His first campaign was more targeted towards uh, miracles. And on his second campaign, he comes back to Galilee, and his main focus is parables. There's a distinction here. He's saying, yeah, you saw me do all the miracles. Now listen to what I have to say. And the thing about parables that's funny is this, is that it will measure someone's eagerness. And when I say eagerness, what I mean is the casual observer go, Soil seed, yeah, oh, okay. Can you just do that thing that you did last time? Because I brought some friends and I kind of told them you could do some cool stuff. Can we just get to that part? But someone who's eager that goes, you've already proven who you are. Tell me what you have to say. Okay, what does that mean? Do you see how a parable measures eagerness? His second trip, he was testing their trust. Are you gonna demonstrate an eagerness to know who I am, to hear the word of God? Or is it just the guy that's on the side going, hey, we found a tightrope walker. I think the problem probably lies in the fact that we love watching Jesus do what we know he can do, but we don't always trust that he's willing to do it for us. Or, or we catch ourselves balancing for him. Here's a parable. Matthew 13 says, Then he told him many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. It, nothing in this parable would indicate that there was any difference in the seeds. The seeds themselves were all the same. They were perfectly capable. They were able to do everything that the other seed did, but the difference was what? The soil. So the parable is about the soil, but for the sake of the conversation this morning, here's what I want you to hear, is that it says he took a perfectly good seed, placed it on soil that didn't absorb it, and because it didn't absorb it, the seed got stolen. Tracking with me? Now remember the noun and the verb. That means this. The faith that God has given you that was placed in your life has to be guarded. Because if it's not guarded, the enemy comes in and steals it. And because of a lack of trust, it discourages our faith. I can explain it better. I was driving down the road in my truck one day and I noticed the power on my battery gauge was going from good to not good. 
and eventually the truck quit running. And anybody in here that has any kind of knowledge of how mechanics work, that means that I had a bad alternator. You got it. My battery was fine. The noun, my battery, no problem with my battery. It had enough power to start something, but it was not designed to sustain. It was designed to initiate. It was designed to start, to initiate my truck. Because then it needed an action word to sustain my pickup. Follow me on this. So many times we have enough faith to get started in something, but we just white knuckle our faith, hoping that we can be the person that we wanna be. We can do enough good to somehow earn it. How many Christians do you know that are just, ah! We're laughing because we all know somebody who you just wanna be like, just, hey, uh, Jesus told me to tell you to calm down. Just, just chill out because you're sort of making the rest of us look crazy. <laughs> just white knuckling this face because they're hoping that the noun will be enough to sustain them. But if you listen to the parable, it says that the noun died because of the verb. The perfectly good seed that was capable of creating life and creating growth and creating good things in your life, it says that it died because of the verb, because it didn't grow, it was stolen. I think so many times we're depending on our faith that got us started to sustain us and we can't figure out why someone else has so much faith, why someone else seems to be living for God and it just seems to be so hard for us. Why is it so hard for me to live for God? I try and I try and I try and I just continue to fail. And then, then because you don't trust your ability to succeed, then you start to doubt, well, like, is any of this even real? Because nobody's trying harder than I am. If I'm trying this hard, why am I not getting the results from God that I wanna get? And then what happens? It begins to eat away at your faith. You begin to doubt things that you used to believe because you're not getting the results, not based on the noun, based on the verb, not based on the amount of faith that you had, based on the amount of trust that you exhibited. Trust is a weird one because you're gonna aim it at something. You ever thought of that? You're gonna trust something. The people who said, I mean, it, it, even at a basic level, the people who said, I wouldn't trust him to carry me across the tightrope, instead I'm gonna place my trust that the ground I'm standing on won't collapse below me. I mean, I know that's a, a terrible analogy, but you're, gonna, you're, you're, you're trusting something all the time. So listen to this. In James chapter two, it says this. It says, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? This passage in the Bible has created and sparked a lot of arguments because we wanna believe, and we, we do believe, that at salvation, we're forgiven. That at salvation, you're never more loved and accepted and all this, Right? The salvation, you're completely loved and accepted. But it says, what is faith without works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you give him nothing, none of the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Let me ask you this. If somebody outside the church were to say, man, I'm hungry, do you have anything to eat? And you were to go, Jesus said the bread of life. Okay, bye. Is, it, is what you said, is it true? Yeah. No, it's true, but does it help that guy? No, why? Because you took truth and you applied no action. You follow me? I think sometimes the problem with Christianity is it's we know a lot and we do a little. We have enough faith to believe, but we don't have enough trust to act on it. And we say things that actually cause more doubt. Our actions rob people of their faith. Follow me. Because then if you, if you only give them just a nugget of like, well, God's the bread of life. He could give you all you need. Okay, bye. Then that person's gonna go, yeah, well, if that's true, why isn't he? Why, if God's a good God, am I going through these struggles? Why, if God's a good God, am I going through the things that I'm going through? How do you see people that have this and then other people have this? And they're left with so many questions until eventually your actions eat away. You might actually be a part of what steals the seed that's been placed in their life. Because you're applying the wrong verb to a proper, no, that's an actual thing, an actual noun. Proper noun, that's a whole different conversation. We'll get to it some other week. <laughs> if the seed never takes root, it dies. So this idea that you believe that God is capable of doing all the things that you believe he can do is only useful if it begins to take root in your life. 
if you actually believe that God is who he said he was and you actually believe that he can do the things he said he did and he actually loves you the way that he says he loves you and he actually wants a relationship, it has got to spark an action in your life that says, then what can I do, God? What do you want me to do? How can I go further? How can I figure out who you've called me to be? How can I be the guy that just hangs on to your back and lets you take me where I'm supposed to go? See the action that follows uh, uh, the now? James chapter one says it this way. If any of you lacks wisdom... You know when the Bible says wisdom, you know what that translates to in 2017? Do anybody know? Common sense. Common sense. I mean, we, we, we love the word wisdom because it does make us sound smarter. But I'm gonna read that verse again. If any of you lacks common sense, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. So this verse, standing on its own two feet, this verse alone says if you lack wisdom, you should ask God. And it says then when you ask God, he will what? Give it to you. There we go. I was gonna wait. I was just, I was determined. I had to get an answer. That if you ask God for wisdom, he will give it to you. And then it goes even further. It says, without finding fault. That means that, that you ask for wisdom and God isn't got a, he doesn't have a checklist going, okay, you want wisdom? Let's see. Did you make your bed? Oh. Were you nice to your, you know? He says, no. He says, you want wisdom? There, I'm going to give it to you. You want common sense? Here, I'm gonna let you have it. It says that he gives without finding fault. If you lack wisdom, let him ask. But listen to the next verse. Verse seven says this, or six, I mean. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Now listen to this and and see if this creates a question for you. In verse seven, that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. But now wait a minute. Didn't verse five say that if you ask, he'll give it to you? But verse seven says a person like that should not expect to get anything. So what happened? Where's the disconnect between if you ask, he'll give it to you, but if you doubt, you'll get nothing. Doesn't that sound like a pre-qualifier? It says, yeah, you can ask, but you better not doubt, doesn't it? Doesn't it act like, doesn't it kind of sound like God's going, you want wisdom? Ask. Oh, you doubted. Mm. How many of you guys have ever felt like, man, I could just be such a better Christian if I just had more faith? Oh, I, I would give more if I just had more faith. I would be better in relationships if I, just, if I just had more faith. If I just had as much faith as that guy, then I could, I could obey God like that guy and I could get what that guy gets. Don't say you haven't done it. We've all done it. And then you read a verse like this and you go, maybe that's why I'm not getting what I want from God. Maybe my faith just, because I can't help it. I'm just a doubter. You know what doubters generally refer to themselves as? Realists. <laughs> no offense. What this verse is actually saying is this. It says, you ask for wisdom, and God says, sure, here you go. But don't you know that godly wisdom sometimes acts in opposition to human wisdom? Don't you know this? That God's system is not based on scarcity, it's based on plenitude. So when God says, I have plenty, don't forget that, The world comes by and goes, yeah, God may say that he has plenty, but then why are people starving? Oh, that's a good point. Doesn't that seem like a good point? That's a good point. Uh, Yeah, well then, why if God has plenty? And then what happens is doubt comes in. Doubt comes in, you start doubting. You're like, well, I heard what God said, but then I'm also hearing what the word says. And Oh, well, I don't don't know what's right. And what has happened? What has happened? The Bible says that the enemy comes in and he steals what God gave you. It says that he sneaks in and he snatches away what God is starting. You start down the road like, we're gonna go somewhere. We're gonna do some good. We're gonna accomplish some things. We're going places. And then all of a sudden something happens. And have you ever accomplished anything without a struggle? Anything worthwhile without a struggle? Nothing really good comes without a struggle. So the problem is the struggle happens. Conventional wisdom comes in and goes, hey man, I think you might've missed God on this one. Oh yeah, maybe I did. Doubt comes in and it says that he Sneaks away what God gave you, just like the soil says that God gave you something good and the noun dies because of the verb. So how do you, this is, okay, so I'll, I'll admit, this is where I go in over my head on the English language. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, gracefully back up because guard is a verb and trust is a verb, which I do know that that makes in that sentence a compound verb 
but I don't know. I don't know how to sort of navigate. So we're going to change the wording (laughs) because I want to. Because remember, your trust is going to be targeted at something. You're either going to trust in God or you're going to trust in yourself. You're going to trust that God will do what he says he is or you're going to trust that there's another way to get what you want from God. Adam and Eve trusted themselves over God because they wanted equality with God. You know, I don't think they ever hated God. I just think they wanted to be friends with him so they didn't have to be submitted to him. See this? So instead of, instead of guard your trust, let's say it this way. How about, because when you say guard your trust, doesn't that sound like, no, yeah. mine. <laughs> instead of guard your trust, what about, because that's just like, no, no, no. What if we change the wording to be intentional with your trust? Because if you're intentional with your trust, it indicates that you're gonna say yes to something, but what? See the difference there? And I can make all sorts of sense from the English language out of being intentional with your trust. You're gonna trust something, so we need to make sure that we're placing our trust in the right place. Because again, otherwise, what happens is faith dies because of the lack of trust. I had a conversation with a guy, um, and, and he was, it was just recently, and he was saying, man, I just have a heart, I have this desire to do this thing. I have, he has this thing that he's wanting to do. He goes, man, I just, I, I, I really want it. I've got a desire to do it. He goes, but every time I start thinking about it, then I'm like, well, ah, yeah, but that's gonna be expensive. And financially, I just don't know if I should do it. He goes, but financially, I'm okay. And then I'm like, well, but my family, he's like, but my family's grown, they're fine. You know, he goes, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm battling with it because I wanna do it, but I just, I, I just don't know. I just, I haven't heard from God on it. And I, I've been praying about it. And does this sound like anybody? <laughs> sound like anywhere you've been in your life? of like, I'm just praying for an answer because I wanna do the right thing, but I, I don't know. And, I said, okay, as I just thought, if God were to tell you no, would you listen? I'm gonna ask you this. If you were praying about something and God were to tell you no, would you listen? If the answer is, I don't know, different conversation. But generally what I believe is this. If God made no very clear, I believe a majority of us in here would honor that. I just tend to believe that. I tend to believe that if God gave us a clear answer that we would honor it. And I said, if God told you no, would you stop? And he goes, Oh, yeah, absolutely. I said, the desire's there. Here's what the enemy would like to do, because remember, we're talking about faith and trust, right? The answer probably, to over-spiritualize something from Pastor Jordan, the answer that I would say that God's probably telling you is this. I don't care. If you wanna go for it, go for it. If you choose not to, that's okay too. I'm gonna bless you regardless. Either way, I'm still God. I'm not depending, I'm not withholding my goodness based on you getting the exact right answer. Does this help anybody this morning to know that this is how God operates? God says, no, hey, I love you. Like if you go left and I really intended for you to go right, we can fix it. It's not like I'm gonna withhold my goodness based on your performance because that would mean that your performance earned my goodness. If it's an obedience issue, different. God will withhold consequence. I mean, but, but assuming your heart is to follow God, I said, so here's the thing. The enemy knows that you're probably gonna go for it. And I think God is probably saying, hey, whatever you wanna do. I, I mean, if God had a strong opinion on it, I trust your ability to hear from God. So God's kind of going, hey man, just whatever. But the enemy, what he wants to do is to make sure that first time you hit those struggles, because remember, anything worth doing comes with struggles. The first time you run into a struggle that the enemy can go, oopsie, you missed it. You should have waited a little longer. You shouldn't have moved. You shouldn't have acted. You shouldn't have did what you did. You shouldn't have gone there. Now you messed it up and he's gonna rob you. And so even though you're at a place where God and you are in good terms, like you and God are fine, the enemy's gonna come around and go, you missed it, you messed up. Now God's mad at you. If the enemy can convince you that God's mad at you, then a communication between you and God is way more difficult. This is, this is a, just a carpet bomb of truth this morning. But so many times, I think the initial problem is not the problem. It's the fallout from loss of trust. That when we lose trust, it eats away at our faith. And all of a sudden, something that wasn't a problem becomes a problem. And the enemy goes, hey, I don't care what you do. As long as I can rob you of your joy and your peace and all the things that God provides, if I could just make sure that you're miserable, I can ruin this for you. So I walk away from that conversation. I'm thinking, God, that was like, I think I needed that. That makes sense. I, I, I get that. I understand that. The next day, I'm talking to a guy, and he said this. 
man, I worked really hard to get down here. He's in Arizona. He said, I worked really hard. I got all my business put together. I, I, I got a lot of stuff taken care of at home. And, you know, I crossed my T's. I dotted my I's. My wife is in full support. Everything's fine. He goes, but I get down here and it's expensive. And now I'm just wondering, like, am I even supposed to be here? Doesn't this sound like a similar conversation? I'm just wondering if I'm supposed to. I said, okay, let me ask you something. Did God tell you not to come? He goes, well, no. In fact, he kind of made a way for it, but I mean, I, I didn't like I'd get an answer. I said, if God would have told you no, would you have listened? He goes, yeah, absolutely. I said, so in my opinion, in my opinion, and this is what I'm gonna tell you also, in my opinion, what happens is the enemy, God goes, hey, either way, like you're, you're, you're going or you're staying does not determine how I feel about you. Like we're okay, I love you. Your specific decisions, if it's an important decision, he'll let you know, Okay. Fair enough. If you're really praying about something that's gonna be real life-changing, God will make it clear to you. If God hasn't given you a specific answer, then move forward with the amount of trust that regardless of which way you go, God can manage it. Does this help your trust at all? Does this help develop a little bit of trust of like, oh, okay, okay. So, so regardless, it doesn't have to be the exact right action as long as it's based in faith and grows in a trust for God. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Because if our trust fails, then the enemy comes in and he goes, you're in the wrong place. You made the wrong decision. God's upset with you. Don't even go talk to him. Just take my word for it. He's gonna be mad at you. And the noun begins to die because of the verb. So what does it look like? I'm gonna say guard your trust again, but what would it look like to be intentional with our trust? And I would say this, that you no longer try to balance yourself. that you stop putting pressure on yourself to get it exactly right or to, to nail it or make sure you're doing it exactly the way it's supposed to be done. Take a little of that pressure off. Stop balancing yourself. Let me read you this quote again. Blondin said this, until I clear this place, be a part of me. I would say this is exactly the demonstration of God carrying us going, hey, until we get to the other side, just be a part of me. Mind, body, and soul, if I sway, sway with me. Do not attempt to do any balancing yourself. Now listen to this verse and see if this verse now makes a little more sense. Colossians 3.3 says that we're supposed to not only believe, we're supposed to act on that belief. That so many times the relationship falls apart because of a lack of trust, because of our lack of willingness to act on what we say that we believe. We carry this pressure that we're balancing, that we have to get it exactly right, or what if God does this, and why can I go that? Is God mad at me? Is God upset with me? What if I wear this shirt today, and he's supposed, I was supposed to wear that shirt? I mean, man, if you think the enemy's gonna leave you alone, he can have you concerned about every little meaningless detail of your life, or are you doing it exactly right? And the war, <laughs> Blondin says, stop, 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 stop trying to balance yourself. Keep in mind, you're just clinging to Jesus, going, God, where do you wanna take us? And when there's a decision to be made that matters, please make the answer clear to me because I want to do what you want me to do. Balancing yourself is exhausting. It will rob you of the joy of your life. It'll rob the peace. You can even be obeying and have no peace and no joy because you're so caught up in am I doing it right? Colossians 3.3 says this, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. That's a hard, that's a hard verse because he says, oh, you're not walking anymore. You haven't been walking for a while. You're clinging to Jesus and Jesus is doing the walking. You're hidden in Jesus and he's carrying you where you need to go. Take a little bit of pressure off yourself. Just know that the pressure that you feel in part is imagined. Don't let the enemy come in and snatch away the joy of God taking you to new places. God gave you a measure of faith that says his desire is to know you, to love you, to have a relationship with you. That's what he's pursuing in you. That's the faith part. The action is believing that he's doing it for you. And that when it's something that you need to know, he is faithful to get the message across. Let's pray. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to tell you real quick, we had, a, we had a young man after the first service in the green room, and, and through the course of the conversation, I said, have you ever asked Jesus in your life? And he said, no. I said, do you want to? And he goes, yes. <laughs> 
I think the clarity that I have this morning is this, is that we put so much pressure on ourselves to get it right. We have this desire to clean ourselves up before we come to Jesus, but his word says that you carry in your mess and you, because he sees it anyway, you carry in your mess, you set it at the foot of Jesus and he helps you sort through it. Hey, I wanna tell you, there's trust required for that. Do you know how much trust is required to go in and trust that when God sees all your garbage, he's still gonna love you? There's a tremendous amount of trust that comes with believing the word that says that God loves you regardless. So what a perfect opportunity this morning to put action to that, to that word. That God says, I love you. My desire is to have a relationship with you. And oh, by the way, you don't clean yourself up. You just jump on my shoulders and I'll walk across the tightrope. So this morning, if you're here and you need to accept Jesus into your life, if you need to just climb onto the shoulders of Jesus and go, I've seen what I do with my life when it's on my own. I just need, I just need you to carry me. I'm gonna pray and I'm just gonna encourage you to pray with me. Just repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for the cross. Thank you for the forgiveness that's available because of what you did there. Please forgive me. Carry me and take me where you want me to go. Help me to operate in trust that grows out of the faith that I received as a gift. Please forgive me. Take me with you. With heads bowed and eyes closed just for a second without anybody looking around. Uh, we, don't, we don't have anybody come forward. It's not anything like that. We're not gonna, the idea is not to make this a public declaration, but just so I can be praying for you, here's what I'm gonna ask. If you're here this morning and you say, I need to act on the faith. I believe that God's pursued me. I believe that God loves me. I don't know why, I can't explain it, but I believe that, that what you said, I believe it. And this morning you wanna act on that by saying, I need to have Jesus come into my life. I, I gotta have him carry me. I'm tired of where my life has taken me on my own. Right where you're at with heads bowed and eyes closed. If, if you would, would you raise your hand? Let me know who you are. I'll be praying for you this week. Yeah, we got hands up all over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Secondly, and you can look up for this one. We do this from time to time. I, I, like, I like the idea because so many times I think you go to church and the enemy meets you at the door and goes, don't screw up. Everybody in here is not like you. Don't let your guard down or they'll see who you really are. I like the idea that we can, we can have those moments that go, you too? So with everyone looking around, if you would say this, I get the noun, I believe the word, I believe what the word says, I need help with the verb. I need help acting on what I believe to be true. I need help learning how to act on what I claim to believe. Would you raise your hand? Now keep them up for a minute, for a second, just for a second. Now I want, you see the hands? Here's what I'm gonna ask. Imagine, imagine what happens in Powell Butte, Oregon if this many people right here begin to act on what we say we believe. Can you imagine, you put your hands up. Can you imagine what would happen because people would go, wait a minute, I didn't really believe it. But now I see it. A group of people standing on the sidelines claiming to believe something is very, 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 very ineffective when it comes to persuasion. But a group of people who have their head down that are doing, that are acting, that are adding a verb to the noun, the works going with the faith, if you are acting on what you say you believe, you are a thousand times more believable. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for who you are to us. God, thank you for the faith that you gave us as a gift. But Lord, the trust isn't guaranteed. There's a certain amount of accountability that we have to take for our actions to act on what we claim to believe. Help us to do exactly that, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.